Next, we have Ed Edinger from Edinger Engineering Associates, who will present the Malcolm Shabazz project. This innovative model of climate adaptive infrastructure is designed to serve as a community area of refuge during crisis, featuring an advanced black water reuse system as part of a comprehensive strategy for water conservation and resilience. Over to you, Ed. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ed Ettinger. I'm the Managing Principal of Ettinger Engineering Associates. Let's talk about making tomorrow today through the lens of our project, the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Plaza. So a little bit about our firm and my background so you understand our perspective. Um, we're an MEP, Sustainable Civil Field Verification, low voltage consulting firm. Uh, we're in the heart of Midtown Manhattan. We've been doing it since 1960. Our projects are larger than smaller, typically a city block like the one shown on the screen here. Uh, this is the Variety Boys and Girls Club project, which is an ICERTA Buildings of Excellence Award winner. There's a lot of really interesting stuff inside of this project, geothermal systems, uh, it's lead gold. Um, there's a, a live uh, energy monitoring uh, kiosk based system so we can understand the greenhouse gas emissions of the project in real time, PV systems on the roof and so on. And our firm really thrives kind of at the intersection of traditional uh, consulting roles and sustainability. To tell you where we're going today, we're going to kind of ground in the, sustain the concept of sustainable circularity uh, and see how that applies to the design concepts that we're deploying through the project. We'll then touch a little bit on uh, resiliency at the project as well, and then move to close. So let's talk a little bit about circularity for a minute. Traditional economies are linear, right? Make, take, dump. Uh, the single-use plastic bag, disposable water bottle are kind of classic examples of this. And we're trying to move to a more circular mindset, as you can see on the graphic on the right, move towards make, use, collect, transform, reuse. And the question is, how can we apply this to the built environment? We're starting to see examples in our marketplace where the regulatory community has, has brought threads of this into our universe. Our local Department of Environmental Protection, which owns and manages our, our sewer and water mains, created new rules for stormwater management uh, practices a couple of years ago. And they look to compare the stormwater matter management practices deployed on a building site to that of a grass field making us kind of think about how we can live as though we aren't here. It starts to bring questions to, to mind. Are we entitled to build as we please, or should we, as Brandon spoke about, seek to reduce the embodied carbon of the concrete embedded in a project and similarly? So we take this very seriously in our practice, and we, and we really try to push the limits on what we can do at a building level. So sure, we can start by reducing and reusing materials. This can literally be material reuse, which we'll talk about as, as, as embodied in our project, but it can also be thought of a little bit more abstractly applied to MEP systematic design concepts. Heat recovery can be unlocked through electrification and thinking beyond a single user, single building mindset. This is a mixed use project and we've unlocked multiple heat recovery opportunities therein that we'll speak about as well. So let me introduce the project. Um, currently, this is an open air through lot project in Harlem. You can see on the picture at top right, the Malcolm Shabazz Harlem market is a uh, direct lineage to Malcolm X, is actually operated by his mosque uh, today and their development partner on the project. And the origin of the project really comes from two places. First, we want to enclose, uplift, revitalize this market. It'll be conditioned, properly ventilated. They'll have permanent bathrooms. They'll be able to cook. And then the second impetus underneath the project are the residential towers that you see rising on either frontage. Harlem badly needs affordable housing, and those will be affordable housing towers rising above. We're very fortunate to have a wonderful partnership in the mosque, in proceeded construction, think architecture and design. And we're humbled to have been given the Distinguished Blue Ribbon Award by NYSERDA through the last round of the Buildings of Excellence competition for the work that we'll, we'll discuss as well. So as we think as a firm about unlocking circular 
design opportunities, we really like to start at ground zero, really at concept level. And we're very fortunate here to have many, many stakeholders at the table at the beginning. We have a very community-centered design as we have tons of stakeholder input and collaboration through the mosque, through the developer themselves. And this has enabled us to really think of the building's architecture in partnership with it, 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 of the neighborhood and its well-being. We spoke about how this is uplifting the market, but we've really, in a circular manner, found opportunities to do this in a way that is mutually beneficial, not only with the, both the residential and market tenancies within the building, but within the neighborhood as well. And I'll start with a few examples as we head towards circularity. First of all, we're bringing cooking, commercial cooking operations to the marketplace. So we still get questions like, hey, can we electrify commercial cooking? And sure, induction cooking is uh, not only possible, but uh, operational, operationally cost beneficial in many ways to traditional gas-based commercial cooking. But when you push further, we found that electrified cooking can actually be done cheaper than fossil-based approaches because with electrified-based systems, we are uh, able to use uh, UL-listed recirculating hoods that eliminate traditional heavy black iron expensive ducts that are that are used to manage uh, gas-based byproducts and, and um, the grease-laden exhaust that can be flammable. Uh, so we found a way to not only electrify this market, but in a way that's cheaper than would have been done uh, elect otherwise. Similarly, and we'll talk about this more, the market has now permanent refrigeration racks that are generating waste heat year round. In a symbiotic, symbiotic and circular manner, we are using the waste heat to make domestic hot water for the apartments above. And we are able to unlock these types of things by having stakeholders at the table as early as we've been fortunate to have them. Pushing further into other circular aspects of the design, let's start looking at the use section of the circle. And we, of course, start to, by asking, how can we minimize the use of the project? The, the project is Passive House certified, which will ensure that the overall energy use will be as low as practical. And that will also bring high quality ducted fresh air to both the residential and market portions of the project. In doing so, we've deployed energy recovery ventilation systems, air to air heat exchangers that ensure that the energy used to ventilate the building is 85% lower than, than would those pieces of equipment been absent. Looking further, the HVAC systems for the residential portion of the building are packaged heat pumps. These systems penetrate the facade of the building as can be seen in the image and are traditionally antithetical to the very nature of passive house projects. The reason we have pushed to bring PTHPs to the project is again with a circular mindset. We do not feel entitled to use as much refrigerant as traditional split, say VRF systems might, might bring to the project. So by eliminating the literally miles of refrigerant from the project that would otherwise exist in a, path, in a package system, we've reduced the embodied carbon footprint in the on-site refrigerant charge by 80 to 90%. This is one of the first projects globally to do this as far as we're aware, and it has not been easy. We've had lots of conversation with manufacturers about the best way to do this, and we could have a whole session about that. In, in its own right, but the push to do so really stems from the circular mindset that this project brings to the, to the, to the fore. In other ways, uh, we've minimized use. We have a uh, full trellis solar panel arrays atop both, both residential towers, reducing our, our operational carbon footprint by nearly a fifth. We've also found creative ways to daylight the corridors. But again, coming back to the symbiosis between the two uh, users of the space, we've really revolved the courtyard design around such that has found a way to bring a natural light corridor that allows us to daylight much of the marketplace, as you can kind of see in the picture on the right, while at the same time being very mindful of the residential amenity design that lives between the two tower setbacks, bifurcated in half with quiet reflection zones and other areas for greening. 
Beyond reducing our used footprint, we've also sought to actually reuse as many, find ways to reuse uh, as, as the project design has allowed. The project uses a fully recycled brick facade and also within that amenity courtyard, we have a rainwater harvesting system that will provide all of the irrigation water needs of the project so that no water is drawn from the city water main. We spoke about this earlier but we are using a little, but a, a little bit, but we are using black water source heat pumps to provide domestic hot water for the project. This is ultimately circular in that it takes the waste heat generated by the residential apartments, the showers, the, the waste runoff, and feeds a heat pump to make domestic hot water. So we're literally taking the energy that we're using out of the water stream and sending it right back. The reason we sought to use black water source heat pumps is that they're one of the most energy efficient systems on the market. And not only that, we're taking the waste heat from the market refrigeration racks, as I mentioned earlier, to boost the efficiency of the system even, even further in an ultimate gesture of design circularity. Pushing beyond circularity, let's talk a little bit about resiliency. And here I'm actually gonna speak not only about the Malcolm Shabazz project, but the other project on one of my introductory slides, that Variety Boys and Girls Club of Astoria, as I'd like to really highlight two approaches to resiliency our firm has taken. We start with a goal that it's something like having grid independent backup power. We like to find a way to provide areas of refuge to tenants within our projects, areas where when power's gone out, they can be heated, they can be cooled, they can have access to refrigerators that are cooling uh, critical medications, they can charge their cell phones. We start with this goal alike. The Malcolm Shabazz project is small enough that by code, it does not actually require an emergency generator. So here in this case, we've chosen to deploy PV powered battery backup systems that will provide just the very areas of refuge we seek to provide for the amenities and the front of house spaces, pushing beyond a traditional fossil based backup and finding a way to really achieve ultimate carbon neutrality on an emergency and resiliency front. The Variety Boys and Girls Club project on the other side is a bit larger and an emergency generator that is fossil powered is code required. As opposed to eliminating fossil fuels from the project completely, we've chosen to lean into the generator. It's oversized, and not only are we going to use it to provide areas of refuge within the building, but we're gonna reach in a circular symbiotic manner out into the community and turn parts of the club into a community-based cooling center that not only affords areas of refuge to our tenants, but to the community alike, and we've also found a way to make grab and go meals available during such scenarios. Furthermore, now that we have this upsized generator, we've turned ourselves into a demand response partner with Consolidated Edison, our local electric utility. In the middle of the summer, when cooling loads are at peak, the demand response program will call the building and say, hey, can you load shed 500 kilowatts? And we'll run our generator and we'll help the grid. In doing so, we get a payment from the utility provider and we've effectively monetized an oversized generator to create not only a payback period that is financially grounded, but make the areas of refuge and for not only ourselves and the community and become the community partner that we, that we would optimally seek to be. As we move to closure, the session has been about the future and making the future our, of our future, the future. So there are lots of things our firm thinks about and otherwise. How do we make induction cooking the norm? How do we make geothermal systems more accessible? How do we advocate for appliances that are modular, designed for recycling, and so on? We think that our job collectively is to continue to look and push for cross disciplinary opportunities beyond our boundaries, to think circularly, much in the way we've embodied the design practice for Malcolm Shabazz. And when I'm ever given an opportunity to publicly speak, I often like to close with a challenge that will challenge, channel exactly what we've been speaking about. Really, I would hope 
that we would all not be fearful of starting a conversation with sustainable design intent grounded in circularity and otherwise, to push for more, to advocate for opportunities that push the envelope literally much as the passive house envelope of this project does and otherwise. Don't be afraid to think beyond yourself, talk to manufacturers, regulators, colleagues, and push for the change that we need. But of course, this has to be practically grounded, much as the demand response generator that we just spoke about is. We can create areas of refuge, not only for ourselves, but for a community in times of need with a financial payback period. Thank you so very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Ed, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic there. I love that you're leaving us with uh, a challenge and some really common threads from uh, the rest of today there in terms of getting teams on board and, and uh, asking good questions early on in the project.